Welcome back. Uh, I'm Pedro Rivera. I'm the director of Studio X Real, so I'm a little bit uh, kind of uh, self integrated to do kind of similar things back in Rio de Janeiro. And I moderate this table. So this table is about, the name of this table is Why Not the Whole City as a Play Site? So we have been looking at a sequence of presentations. So for example, Alexander yesterday mentioned the pattern language, as a, Alexander's pattern language. Tim mentioned affordancy, which he gave the example of this step here that you can use as a stage or as a sitting place. Jens mentioned infrastructure as playscapes in Colombia with the example of the water reservoir. But now we are going to look at people who are actually doing those things, who are actually designing or act active, actively transforming spaces in the city. And we also we're going to bring the question which, what, what if the whole city is a play site? Not only dedicated spaces, but also what, if, what, if, what would happen if the whole city functions as spaces that we, the kids, the toddlers, the babies can enjoy. So our first, uh, sorry. our first speaker is Edgar Blitz. Edgar Blitz. Edgar runs a practice called CARF uh, in the Netherlands, which has a focus on public space, especially looking after children and young. So welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, it's good to be back and I'm happy to be re-invited again, because it's the second time for me in Istanbul in relation to Istanbul 95. Um, just let's start, um, because otherwise it will take too long. I only have 15 minutes and I tend to speak long. Um, the city as a playground, something that intrigued me always. Uh, first of all, I'm the speaker, but I want to show, what I'm going to show is a project. I'm going to elaborate on the pro project, but it's the whole team that is actually involved. It's not just me. And I always show this image because I want to know that we still try to think as kids. It's the same people that you just saw before. We try to be naive, surprised, unwittingly when we start a, a, a project. Uh, we work all around, uh, all over the world, although I rather would like to work in, let's say, Europe, because it's ridiculous that you invite someone here to work in Asia, at least. That's what I think. Um, this is one of the projects we're known for. This is actually to uh, a, a renewal uh, of a former mine site in Belgium. This is a project in Eindhoven that we did together with um, uh, a landscape architect and Pete Outdoor to make a interesting public space at Strijd S. This is uh, probably the best known project for uh, the Turkish audience because this is at the Zola Center, uh, a commercial play space, but actually it's public and everybody is happily invited to go play there. Um, and another one in Copenhagen. Copenhagen and Amsterdam have been meant uh, frequently. I cannot help it. Uh, this is at the new blocks building site uh, at the Copenhagen, Copenhagen Harbor. But um, today I'm going to tell about the Van Beuningen Plan. And the Van Beuningen Plan is a project that we actually uh, started with in 2007. Um, we finished the preparations of the design in 2008 and I think it was um, uh, constructed in 2010. Um, but I'm going to relate, that to, to relate this to a um, publication called The Active City that we did, uh, we did uh, an essay in there. It was commissioned by the city of Amsterdam. Uh, and the main part is written by uh, Orhan, an urbanist um, agency in Amsterdam. And our part was, of course, about playgrounds, leisure, etc. But the whole thing or purpose of this book is how can we rebuild our city in a sustainable, active, healthy city? Um, and what are the design tools for play and leisure and activity that we can implement? The whole book is about cycling path, uh, healthcare, 
further transport, um, and so on and so on. Actually also walking, I never hear walking. Pedestrian is also, uh, walking in the city is also very interesting. But the main things is, uh, uh, or the main uh, conclusions already about play spaces is they need to be multi-purpose, and they need to be challenging, but without borders. That's the most important thing. Um, and we need to understand that we're talking about a densifying city, although Amsterdam is not as dense as Turkey. How can we, we suffer the same problems. There's developers, we need new housing. And how can we deal with the spaces that are left actually as public spaces? And how can we deal with that as playgrounds? Um, so we're talking about the importance of physical activity and we're also talking about the importance of spatial justice. And I'm not telling anything new here. Everybody knows this image. Uh, everybody knows that whatever age you are, you need to be physically active for, uh, to stay healthy. Actually, from an economical perspective, it's good to stay healthy. Maybe if we put it to a financial point, that's something to be considered by uh, people as well. But then I thought, let's introduce a very uh, Agnes Kant, former Dutch politician. She's no longer active, but she wanted to introduce the 3% rule for play spaces. And actually, I thought when we compare this to Istanbul, it already shows that even the 3% rule that never made it as a, as a law, actually, is not even catering for all the kids in uh, Istanbul. It's only catering for the half of the 0 to 3 years old. But we're talking about the whole group, 0 to 14 here. So even in uh, a country, the Netherlands, where you think that it's all being done well, there's lots of space, there's lots of place. We are suffering less than 3%, so we're not even, the, even there. Okay, from Bönninge. Uh, I call this a journey through history, because there's a history behind playgrounds. Um, in the 19th, uh, or after, yeah, the 20th century layout of Amsterdam, there was the whole thing about uh, healthy movement, getting people outside, doing gymnastics, and in our urban fabric we kept open places and they were meant to be uh, playgrounds for, um, for the neighborhood. Uh, in the 30s of last century, they really became these hubs. It's actually all sand, as you can see, we have discussed that already. Uh, they had organizations there, they organized things for the neighborhood, uh, the kids, that was the place near their home, very nearby, reachable and safe, because you knew that all kids were playing there. 70s, cars start dominating also in Amsterdam. Uh, again, it doesn't compare to Istanbul at all, but we, think, we thought this is a problem. And kids had no place to play anymore, they have to play on the street. And so, in the uh, end of, or actually the zeros, we start re- uh, improving the neighborhood and we organize it a little bit nicer and we have nicer car parks uh, but still the cars are the enemies and block actually if you live in that building there you cannot reach the, uh, the playground that is here because you're always behind the car uh, and what will happen if you go uh, come from behind the car and, uh, and, uh, and you got run over because you don't see it because you're probably a little bit higher than 95 centimeters but let's say 120 um, okay, this is how it is today. This is part of the Van Beuningen plan. And uh, it shows actually, because I'm telling about playgrounds, but it shows actually why it's so important actually to see it holistic. All cars are taken out. We could do this here because we had the opportunity, uh, or there was the opportunity actually that we were going to build a parking garage underneath, so we could take this out. And the interesting part is that all social housing here is now connected to the playground again. People have their own private space in front. It's not private, it's semi-private. It becomes part of the plan. Um, it uh, is a shared space, um, but services or ambulances can still come there if, if, there, if there is a problem. This is, the, this is the new playground. I'm going to tell a little bit more about it later on. Uh, this is the sports area. This is the uh, play area. Uh, and a small uh, facility for uh, to get coffee or chai, I have to say. But what I, I had the opportunity to actually look at my own project last year when I contributed to the book. It's an opportunity that everybody always asks, have you looked into your old project? 
what do you think about it? On one hand, it's uh, judging your own need. On the other hand, it is a good opportunity to, to see why things work. Because designing is very often an intuitive process. And then in the end, you start rethinking, why have you done this? What are the reasons that you have done this? And can you still, after a couple of years, see that this worked? So first, I start to understand who my influences were. And one of them is Aldo van Eyck, who is a known Dutch architect that built 700, um, up to 1,000. People still discuss about how many the uh, playground he has built in Amsterdam, but he actually, uh, and now I'm going to read because otherwise I'm going to elaborate too long, um, I can learn from, uh, from him how play playgrounds can act as a catalyst in, their, in a new modernist environment, inviting people outside and meet through their children activities to build a community. Um, the second one is Constant Nieuwenhuizen, who is uh, an artist uh, that belongs to the Cobra group, and uh, also to the Situationist International, and um, he has a visionary idea on architecture. His new Babylon project is a world in which people no longer have to work long days, are free to move and play, and he frequently refers to the homo ludens. And he advocated for car-free cities in the 60s already, and his artistic models that you see here actually represent his city, New Babylon, but they're almost like a playground, aren't they? And it's very interesting, actually, to read uh, what this guy has been doing in the 60s and the 70s. <coughs> then, another influence is, of course, William White's Social Life of Small Urban Spaces. Most of you might have seen the, the, the footage of this movie because it shows, actually, how people are using public spaces. Uh, I heard Pedro say talking about affordances. You see how they use uh, ledges, benches, how they uh, flock together, how they ignore uh, certain corners. It's something that you, as a designer, take into consideration, but um, uh, it's very interesting to see someone who really studies or has studied this. Um, and then, of course, uh, Beatrice Colomina. I learned from her that people's expectation uh, is built up by mass media and not, they, they are actually very conservative in their ideas because that's the image that they see. And you can actually extrapolate that to a playground. A soccer cage is a soccer cage, period. And a playground is a post platform system. And when it is something else, they find it very difficult actually to accept. And uh, the last but not least is the design of everyday things, um, and that is about perceived affordances. And Donald Norman is the director of the design lab at the University of California, and he introduced this um, uh, term perceived affordances, and it is about design and usability engineering. And perceived affordances describes, in short, to look at the usability of things, not from the perspective of how they can be use rather than what they are intended for. So it's in the eye of the beholder how you can use something. And I'm showing you this because afterwards I realized that we implemented all these thoughts in our design for the from learning a plan. So now we get to the from learning a plan. How much time am I? I'm good. Okay, I tried to do it really fast. Okay, you have to understand where we are. The purple line is the periphery of Amsterdam. Amsterdam is a small city. It's actually exactly as big as Tirana, 800,000 inhabitants. We think we are a really big city in the world, but we're just a little dot. And the uh, middle grey area is actually the pre-Second World War um, layout of Amsterdam. That is a neighborhood that at the time when the Van Beuningen Plain um, was rebuilt, I have to say, uh, was not gentrified yet. Uh, if you go to Amsterdam now, you would probably pay an enormous amount of money to get um, an apartment there, but it wasn't at that time. Um, I have showed here this, uh, where the foreboding plan is situated. Here is a, a big road, and actually this piece of the neighborhood was mainly, um, I think, Mor Moroccan. Uh, people from Moroccan uh, originally, and this was a little bit mixed 
working class, although you cannot really use that word anymore. Um, form a square. What is interesting to know, there is a big line of trees around it. Trees are sacred in Amsterdam. Um, it's always interesting to see that the inner courts that you cannot reach, there is also almost a, an urban forest. Um, but these are sacred, you cannot take them out. They kill you. If you, if you uh, take them out, they kill you. Uh, and for the rest, actually there was nothing. Nobody went into this square anymore because it was surrounded by green. Um, and the new plan, actually, we took out all traffic on three sides. There is a possibility to park here because we need to cater for disabled parking spaces. Uh, here is the big road and there is actually three areas on the square and there is a clubhouse for youngsters. Sports area, sitting area, play area and it's surrounded by lots of green. Um, so pro programmatically it looks like this. But more interesting are the transitional zones. And we usually don't design transitional zones. We think in programmatic um, uh, solutions. We need to cater for a playground, we need to cater for uh, a soccer court, we need to cater for uh, benches, we need to cater for uh, young kids, for uh, toddlers, for um, juveniles, for, for everyone. And then they all get their location. And that's not possible in a dense city because you have a small place. Um, this is the smallest basketball court that we could make, but if you just put it in the middle, it already fills up the whole space. Um, so the transitional zones are actually zones, and bring, this brings me back to Norman, that you have to figure out what it is for. And I'm also relating this to the participation process, because if you talk to people, they want to have everything. They want to have a water feature, they want to have a soccer court, a basketball court, they want to have a skate facility, they want to have uh, a playground, a tower, um, everything. And you cannot do that in space anymore, it's impossible. So um, what we try to do is combining sports and play. And what you see here is a very small kit in summertime, usually it doesn't get that warm in Amsterdam, but here it's actually a water um, feature. And if there's many people playing soccer, here's a big one, but here are small ones, but you can also use it in this direction. Um, affordances. Uh, is it seating? Is it the playground? Is it uh, the green area? Uh, who's it for? Borderless spaces. It's very important. You can actually, as a user, occupy in a certain moment in time this space. Uh, and that actually asks for conflicts. And we know that. But these conflicts dissolve in, say, 12 weeks, because people learn how to use that space. Um, un unexpected possibilities. Um, kids find their own space. Uh, this girl is on roller skates. Actually, this little girl is learning from uh, children that are older, that they look at. Um, this is one of my favorites, I call this for toddlers and teenagers, because we tend to design for age groups. But nobody can tell who it's for. And actually toddlers, three years old, use this climbing uh, structure, where in the evening I see girls, 12 years old, sit there and talk to each other. And why is everything so directed when we design a playground or a public space? Why not make it UD, universal design, so it can actually cater for many more things than we actually had expected. Um, again, this part, this is a, a stage, but is it for children, is it for parents? The you know, other thing that we learned, or that I learned by looking at it, that it's important that it doesn't look like a stage, that it doesn't look like a bench, that it doesn't look like a playground, because actually that rules out other possibilities. You cannot use a bench to walk over if it looks like a bench, but if it's just some undefined obstacle, you can use it for many more things. Um, 
stage and seating. You can go sit in there. And we also always look in the design for smaller spaces. So you have the large space and we break it up in smaller spaces for more intimate things if you want to sit together with friends or in this case, we hear, uh, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that there is a discussion here about uh, parenting in relation to men. That is something that's so, you actually you see it here, it's very common in the Netherlands where the men actually also take care of the children. Um, seating and skating, you can, you can do whatever you want. And actually, spectators um, are also a very important group of users on a certain space. So this guy is actually sitting there and watching what is happening on this, uh, on this square. Skating and basketball, he's for sure um, a professional basketball player. He has found his time slot here to use the space. And um, there is actually no conflict because the skaters come in at Sunday afternoon because they're cool. Um, basketball and water play, we said it before. Water play and festival, all this can happen in this space and we think of this as uh, impossible because it's so small. Um, playgroup and neighborhood hub, this is where people meet. Actually, if you see well, here's a nice combination of uh, rubber flooring and sand that can work very well together. Um, and I also have to tell you, I really had to press to get sand in. Um, I think this is the general image of the square. There's so much going on there, but all we try to cater for as many user groups as possible in a very small place, knowing that it's a 24-7 public space and not a playground that is only being used after school or uh, Saturday afternoon. Uh, I want to point out one more thing. There is a commercial uh, run coffee shop here. Um, <laughs> the tables that you see in the front are public. They don't belong to the coffee shop. This is actually to stimulate people to sit there and bring their own lunches. And uh, the, the one that um, uh, runs the, the coffee shop actually is instructed to allow and do so. That is a condition for him actually to use that space. Um, that was my story. I, had, I told you I kept it short. Thank you.